there it is, all in. Very good. Thank you, media team, for another great little intro. Thank you, James. James is on form tonight. It's great. So good. And I don't, I don't, I don't think the notices will ever be anybody's favourite moment, exactly, but it doesn't mean that they don't matter, and you did, you did them so well. And there are always one or two things for us to pay attention. What is a very busy uh, church family, we know that, don't we? I'm really struck again tonight, I, I wonder if others are, by the amazing privilege that we have of doing this. I, I, I don't know, that something about uh, the freedom that we have to gather and to bring all that we are and carry in this, as, as complex human beings. So there we were a week ago, for those who were around last Sunday, which has been many of you, celebrating an amazing baptism evening. And then we've had the weeks that we've had and, and, and different things will have gone on. And, and in here on Friday night, there's a whole bunch of young 20s uh, students having a, a, a really great time with God and encountering God and meeting one another. And at the very same time that that was happening, another bunch of young 20s were in a room over in Paris and something very different was happening. And there's complaints complexity in our world. We just know that. So we have a, a, a local joke actually on the staff that we get a pound for every time we say the word complexity. I mean, if we received a pound every time we said that, we'd be very wealthy indeed. But it's just true, isn't it? All human experience we share in a diverse room like this. So we come as we are, but what we find is that God meets us as we are and he does good things. And I'm sensing that there's a lot of good things happening already here tonight and we need to grab a hold of those for all that they're worth. We need to keep attentive to what God is saying uh, so that we go from this place not just having had a good experience, whatever that might be, but having been fortified and strengthened and spoken to, yes, by one one another, but actually by the Lord God himself. I just find it amazing that he does that and we get to do that freely. Um, We're not constrained. Sometimes think Andrew White was here, wasn't he? Vicar of Baghdad. If this kind of gathering is not encouraged and you get into serious trouble for turning up at something like this in other parts of the world, would you still turn up? Would you still bust a gut to get to something like this, to meet with brothers and sisters, to encounter God? I hope my answer to that will be yes, but it'd be testing and, and uh, mercifully we're spared that. But life is testing and there'll be those get really going through it. And if you're somebody who's come for um, and would really relish a comforting message tonight, you're just in that place, you'd really love to hear some comfort, I'm very sorry. <laughs> Actually, I say that, God, God, can meet, God will meet every need. He'll take the same message and people will hear it very differently. But the series that Mark has encouraged us to, to, to uh, participate in these few Sundays, uh, All In, is not really on the, the comfort end of the spectrum. It's more on the come on church end of the spectrum. And that's okay. It doesn't mean that God's condemning us or or, or throwing a kind of guilt trip and uh, and I pray and hope that I won't do anything like that at all. Uh, The come on church rally cry never comes with that voice of you're not doing well enough, come on, you know, kick out the backside. It comes with encouragement. That's putting courage within us to be the people that we've been called to be. And all in, as the phrase suggests, is are are we that? If you call yourself a follower of Jesus here tonight, are you somebody who's all in for Jesus or just a little bit in? Are you, are you towing the water in? Are you, in the, are you paddling around in the shallows in or are you prepared to be in the deep end and just risk and trust and do all those things actually that we've just been singing about? <laughs> I trust you, Lord. We need to be careful what we sing sometimes, don't we? I think they represent so often our aspirations and our prayers and Mike was reminding us last week in the morning how... We want for Lord, the, the Lord to be Lord of all, otherwise he's not Lord at all, but that's an aspiration. We recognise that in areas of our life he won't be. In fact, there'll be those in the room, and you can't yet say, you're not in that position yet, say, yeah, Jesus is my Lord, you've not kind of reached that point, you're still exploring, and I'm just so grateful that you're here. Thank you for being here, welcome to you from me. I hope you feel very at home among us, and continue to explore, continue to ask those questions. I guess I'm speaking mainly to those who who would say that you've started a relationship with Jesus, that you're, um, that you're following him. And um, we need to kind of buckle our seatbelts a little bit uh, as the Lord just uh, encourages us in this series to be all in for him. I have the privilege, uh, as you do, but I guess in, in a pastor's type role, I get the privilege of having conversation with people that often runs very raw and very deep. And um, that's a huge honor. It's quite daunting at times. Um, and you have these amazing, rich conversations with people at stages of life which can be very, where they can feel very vulnerable. Uh, one of the most poignant things that somebody said to me this week was this. Tim, I don't know who I am anymore. In fact, I wonder if I ever did. It's quite a big thing to say, isn't it? I don't know who I am anymore, and I wonder if I ever did. I wonder how you would answer that question if I, if I, I won't get you to do it. But if you were to turn to a neighbour and I said, tell your neighbour who you are. Who are you? I wonder what you'd say. You might say, you know, 
your name might say, uh, I don't know, whether you're married or got a girlfriend, a boyfriend, or you're a uni student, or uh, you're this or you're that, and this is what you like, and you're an Arsenal supporter, because that's a very key part of who I am, or you, know, you live in Cheltenham, or whatever. You'd say some different things. I wonder how you'd answer that at a slightly deeper level. I'm not a philosopher. Um, I'm not even much of a theologian, as those who've been around <laughs> know quite well, I guess. Um, but it's fairly obvious to us, isn't it, that this thing of who we are, identity, we call it, is really massively important hugely important that we grasp something of who we are, who I am. Lots of our issues, I think, lots of our growth as followers of Jesus is to, to do with getting a firmer grip on the truth of that and less of a grip, so the, more of the truth of who I am as a follower of Jesus, as somebody who's loved by God and being able to let go as the Spirit helps us and reveals things to us and deals with stuff about the stuff about actually who I'm not who I might have believed myself to be, but I'm not that person. That is part of the core of our following him, our discipleship, as we call it, coming to an understanding. How that works, of course, is complex, but we believe, do we not, in the authority of Jesus' word. So who I am, how, where do you go to answer that question? Most obviously, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're going to say, well, what he says about me, what he says about who I am, matters an awful lot more than what I might say that I am, or even what other voices around me might say that I am or who I am. We need to be really careful, don't we? If we're, if we're followers of Jesus, we're saying, no, you have special authority, so I need to hear what you say, rather than what the TV says, or rather than what the, the advertisers say, or what the songwriters might say, or whoever, whoever. So when Jesus says, this is who you are, we need to pay attention. When Jesus says, this is who you are as my followers, then we really need to pay attention. So I hope we've got um, ears attuned to him. We say some amazing things about who God is. He actually says some amazing things about who we are as well. And all of that by way of important introduction to some verses that we're going to look at because Jesus tells us who we are. If you're somebody who said, yeah, I've, I've begun a journey in relationship with Jesus. I've described myself as a follower of his. And I'm going to read three verses from Matthew chapter 5, from the best sermon ever given, the Sermon on the Mount. It begins in Matthew chapter 5, it's on the screen as well, and I think I might have to read it from the screen, because this, the print in these Bibles, man, now I've, I've just about got it, I've got a spotlight on it, we're okay. Matthew 5, 13 to 16, and the first two words if you forget everything else, are the ones I want you to remember, or three words. You are. You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your Father in heaven. Really familiar words, I guess, if you've been around your Bible at all, you probably will have read that or heard it, heard talks on it probably. Register first, please, this, this thing, because this really matters. It is about identity, first and foremost, and not just behavior. Jesus does not say, he could have done, but he didn't. He doesn't say, now go and behave like this. Go and do these kinds of things. Speak like this. When you go into the world, act like this. He does say some of those things in some parts of the scriptures. But please notice that he begins like this. You are. You're to see this as your, part of your core identity as a follower of Jesus. You're the salt of the earth and you're, and, and you're the light of the world. Not you will be when you get your act together. Come on. You haven't made it yet, but study a bit harder. Take a, take a couple of theology classes and then you'll be the salt of the earth. Work a bit harder, pray a bit harder, go to church a bit more, hang out with the right people a bit more. Maybe you'll graduate to be the light of the world. He doesn't say that. Who's he talking to, by the way? I mean, some brilliant, fantastically godly people with halos shining above their heads? No. 
pretty ordinary bunch of people, with no disrespect, pretty ordinary bunch of people, or, you know, diverse, different, fisherman, tax collector, student, probably, accountant. He's talking to a ragbag collection of people who hadn't graduated in some measure of godliness, ordinary. How encouraging is that, friends? Tell me that that's encouraging. Come on, that's encouraging. So yes, it's a little bit of a come on church kind of a message from from this point onwards, but let's grab a hold of that. This is who you are already. Why does he say it? The Romans who occupied the land at the time that Jesus said this, as you know, they had a saying, really well-known saying, so it would have been very kind of, Jesus always picks up on the cultural relevance bit, and the Roman saying went like this, there is nothing more useful and nothing more necessary than sun and salt. That's what the Romans said. There's nothing more useful and nothing more necessary than sun and salt. Because they were in that time. Jesus, therefore, is saying this. There's nothing more useful and nothing more necessary on this entire planet than you. Nothing more necessary, nothing more useful than you in the world. That's a powerful thing to say. You who are my friends and followers. That's an extraordinary dignity that he gives to us. An extraordinary honor that he bestows on us. Uh, not because of anything that we've done. Remarkable, actually, when you think about it. Receive it. You may want to you know, switch off at this point and just meditate on that for a bit. It's astonishing when you think about it. The world can get along with, without a lot of things. The world could really get along very well without um, Radio 1, in my humble opinion. Um, without, uh, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Um, could probably get along without anchovies, don't you think? <laughs> Instant coffee, definitely. Traffic wardens, bless them. Rugby? Yes. <laughs> Controversial in this church. The world can get along without a lot of things, but Jesus says the world cannot get along without the church without the church of Jesus, families and streets and schools and the university and businesses and the NHS and the media and arts, no place, no group, no country, no legitimate human endeavor can really flourish without the presence of Jesus, present through his people because you, we, are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We are as necessary for the health and well-being of this world as salt and sun. That's quite big, isn't it? Not my words, Jesus' words. So the health and the well-being of this world, let's narrow it down a little bit, because that's very big scale. The health and the well-being of Cheltenham is directly linked to you and me living out of this identity that we already are as salt and light. And why is that? Push it a bit further. I was rubbish at physics, even though my dad taught physics at school, so I would never have remembered the second law of thermodynamics, but because I did a research for the talk, I can show off and talk, tell you about the second law of thermodynamics. I think it's known as entropy, or there's a link between them anyway. So physicists will tell me later. But entropy means this that all systems tend towards chaos and disorder. Things run down and degenerate. So this is the scientific description, scientists have come up with it, but it's the scientific description of creation under the curse of sin and human rebellion against the creator. Entropy, things degrading, tending towards disorder. If you don't believe me, look at the back seat of your car. (laughs) Students, look at your desk if you've got one. Do you have desks these days? Probably not. Look at the floor of your room. Without care, what does it tend towards? Most young students, including the ones in my household, the floor of the bedroom tends towards disorder. Look in your fridge without attention, what happens in your fridge? Left and on and on. Left to their own devices, that's entropy at work. Things move from order to disorder, from ease, if you like, to dis-ease in a fallen world. And actually, the only people who should be shocked by that on the macro scale, are those who either haven't read or don't believe their Bibles. Romans 1, Paul writes Romans to the Romans, it doesn't speak about the inevitable getting better and better and better. 
human progress. It talks about human regress. It doesn't talk about human evolution towards some higher plane. It talks about devolution, left to itself without Jesus and without his people. Three times in the chapter, Paul says, God gave them over to the consequences of their rebellion, effectively. God in his infinite love and mercy and justice, part of the outworking of his justice is not to stop us from experiencing the consequences of rebelling against him. And that gets played out again and again and again. The consequences of crashing through his loving boundaries, insisting on ignoring his warning signs for life, listening to every other voice except for his. That's entropy. Stuff degrades, it degenerates, disorder happens. Lord have mercy, we say. And some of the answer the world might say is, well, it's just because we're ignorant. The cause is ignorance and we're getting cleverer and cleverer. And if we can just get a bit more clever, if we can educate ourselves a little bit more or a lot more, and if we can medicate ourselves a little bit more, and if we can organize ourselves a little bit more, and if we can have just improve our systems of law and justice, then that decline will be reversed and we will move towards human flourishing. And of course, friends, listen to me carefully. All of those things are massively important. God is behind all of them. Indeed, Christian people have been behind most of the progress in education and, and uh, the law and, and medicine and so on. Of course, deeply, deeply worthwhile, godly things to pursue. But actually, none of them ultimately reach the true heart of the problem, which, as somebody neatly said, is the problem of the human heart. The human heart in rebellion against God. A heart that is not submitted to God, not in relationship with him, not in receipt of his grace and his forgiveness and his power to love. The world without God is in decay. You have to understand that. Paris, on Friday evening, for all its horror, in one sense, therefore, shouldn't shock us, friends, whilst it disturbs us and moves us, and I pray that we'd have soft hearts of compassion it falls ultimately within that big picture of the world in decay, the world that is anti-God resulting in decay and disorder and distress and not just there, as James said, all over the place. Burundi, where our friend Simon works. As it happens, far more people killed in Burundi in the last week or two. Gets a little less press, it's a little further away and so on and so on. I'm not being cynical about that. But there's pain and suffering everywhere. This is the sign of a fallen world. And salt, Jesus therefore is saying, is who you are and has a lot to do with anti-decay because that's what salt was used for. I know we put salt in to make food taste nice and I'm sure they probably did in those days too but the picture here, the main image here is about salt being that thing that is a preservative that has a different effect on the stuff that is, that is rotting and decaying. You, says Jesus then, are salt. In a decaying world, you're salt. You are, not you can choose to be. You might graduate one day to be. No, you are. It's dark out there. You're light. You're necessary. You're crucial. And we could look at some of the evils being perpetrated around the the world or in our locality. We could all name them stuff around trafficking and slavery and drug abuse and, and, and a whole load of stuff. And we could, we could say, oh, wh- why have they done that? Wh- what's gone wrong with their choices? Um, or, or we could say, where's the salt? Both questions are good questions, but the one we need to ask of ourselves is, where's the salt? We shouldn't be surprised by a world in decay if, if there's no salt present. So our question is, where's the salt? Where's the light? John Stott puts it like this, when meat goes bad, we don't blame the meat. We ask, where's the salt? if you see what I mean, from that culture. When a room is dark, we don't curse the darkness, we turn on a light. You are salt and light. I want to mention five things. I'm going to move fast, I promise, um, that just flow from this. But I've said pretty much what I think God wants us to hear, really. There's a bunch of things that flow from this being salt and light. But that's the key, we've heard the key thing. I hope we've heard the key thing. I've, I really so want to hear it again. It was the you are that really got me. So I looked at this this week. Tim, you are 
Salt, you are light. So now, be who you already are. That's the encouraging thing. I find it so encouraging. Yes, it's challenging. Of course it is. But if this is who we already are, Jesus is saying, so let's go on, live out of that. Remember that and live out of that. Be who you are. So five Bs. Be different. It's the first one. Because that's what salt is. Flows, doesn't it? To make a difference. We're talking about making a difference. Salt makes a difference to meat. It keeps it fresh in that culture. That's the whole point. So in a world of decay, in a world where there's grim stuff going on, we step in where we are salt and we need to make a difference. But to make a difference, we have to be different. Text goes on. If salt loses its saltiness, it's useless. It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled. The suggestion here is that salt in that, in that period could become contaminated. It could be impure the way that they made it, meant that it could get diluted. It could become effectively useless. And what they do with it then is they just chuck it in front of their front door because it was quite good to walk on. A bit like we might grit the roads, I guess. But, um, but effectively something worthless, not, not doing what it was supposed to do. It had lost its distinctive quality. The whole point of salt is to be salty. Distinctive, different from the thing that it's being placed in. It's obvious, huh? it's obvious to say it, isn't it? Gandhi said, he wasn't a Christian, but he really respected um, Jesus, actually. I think he would have become a Christian if the, Christian, the followers of Jesus around him had been slightly more attractive. But he said, you must be the change that you want to see in the world. You must be the change that you want to see. And I kind of agree with that. I think I preface it as a Christian that actually we need to be praying. Prayer precedes everything. It only happens by the power of God, but working through his people. But we pray for the change that we want to see. But yeah, a big part of that is, yes, we're agents of change. Jesus was very different. Let's be honest. We read the Gospels. He's magnetic. People come to him. Why? Because he's different. He's not the same as everybody else around him. There's something distinctive about who this man is whom we are trying to become like in character. So it's okay to say we need to be different. Follows. If we look just like the rest of the world around us, guess what? We're not going to be very effective. Romans 12, 2, you all know it. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. Don't be the same. Apple had it right. I don't know if they use this slogan anymore. Do you remember their first slogan or one of their slogans? Think different. Do you remember that? Think different. Romans 12 says, be renewed, be transformed, be different by the renewing of your mind. Think differently, believe differently, get on board with your identity, get on board with what God says. Believe that and it will work out in your life and you'll be different. Don't try to be different for the sake of being different. Just let God work in you to become different, to be who you are. Values and attitudes and stuff that underpin our actions and our, our behavior and how we speak in the world. You, you know the story about the frog. You know, if you, you put a, a frog in boiling water, it hops out immediately. You put a frog in cold water and you heat up the water, it realizes too late and it boils to death. I've never tried it, but I'm pretty sure that that's what happens. I've heard that story often enough to believe it's true. Friends, we followers of Jesus can become acclimatized to a world that is boiling us to death. We really can. Satan's strategy for destroying Christians in the West, and make no mistake, that's his target, to destroy, kill, maim, and destroy. And as Jules reminded us this morning, by the way, I just want to say this, he's the enemy. Um, people who kill people ultimately are not our enemy. People are never our enemy. The enemy's the enemy. Satan's the enemy. The devil's the enemy who will, will carry his work through, through broken people. Anyway, his strategy for destroying us is not in, in this town anyway, persecution, is it? Very few of you in this uh, room are getting real grief for being persecuted. We're certainly not getting our heads chopped off and people coming in and, and, and causing us physical harm, but it's seduction. And I reckon that's his strategy because it's working, or it has worked. And friends, we, we want to take a stand against that, don't we? Seduced into conforming to the world around us so that we look the same as the world around us. What's the world around us? And please don't hear me have a downer on everything out there that is, you know, not church. I, I'm, I'm not saying that for a minute. That would be horrible to think that we're somehow good and they're bad. That's, that's a nonsense. But actually in the Gospels, Jesus and John, they do talk about the world as they use that terminology. And it means the world that operates according to values and principles that are not godly, that are not Christian. So it's okay. Let's not be squeamish about this whole thing about being different. It's all right. It doesn't mean that we're better. That's different. We're all equal under God. But different, sure, we're called to be different. You're the salt. Unless we're different, we're useless. What's the culture like around us? A few things. Low on self-sacrifice, I would say, for the sake of others. But high on comfort. 
low on kindness, but high on criticism, low on taking responsibility, very high on taking offense, low on gratitude, but pretty high on anger and jealousy and greed, low on the love of neighbor and stranger, pretty high on the love of money, sex and power, and on and on. You might have your own cultural kind of observations too. Friends, we need to look different from from that, don't we? We need to be different, be different. Martin Luther King said how he was pleased to be uncomfortable living in the culture that he did. He said this, I am proud to be maladjusted, uncomfortable, to many things in our social system. And I call on you, talking to Christian people, to be maladjusted as well, not to be comfortable. The world is in desperate need of such maladjustment. In other words, kingdom people who are different like salt. That that old poster, a bit of a cliche, but it still works for me. If somebody arrested you tonight and charged you with being a follower of Jesus, how much evidence would there be to convict you of that charge? Ignoring turning up in a particular room a few times a week. What would the evidence be that you're different, that the presence of Jesus in your life makes you different? Be different together with the second thing. Be different together. Salt, um, it it, it kind of acts a bit together, doesn't it? We can can view a lot through individual lenses. We can read lots of these passages with an individual, just me and God. When it says you, it means me, Tim, or you, you, Barbara, you, Sharon, you, Hills. But actually, a lot of the yous are, are collectively. So we need to read this individually as well as collectively. There's a you together about this. There's something deeply, deeply attractive about... Salt, you are the salt. Salt together. The church together. I just want to remind us of that. So let's not neglect that. This isn't just a message for us as individuals. It is a message for the way that we love one another. What does Jesus say? It's by your love. It's by the way that you love one another that people will know that you're you're my followers. God made himself visible in the form of Jesus. Revealed himself in the form of Jesus. And now he reveals himself in the world in the form of Jesus' people. And the early, the, the early um, society that looked at the church, which was under tremendous pressure and persecution, one of the things that they said about them was, look how they love one another. Look how they love one another. Look at their levels of compassion. Extraordinary, not just for themselves, by the way, but including for themselves. I haven't got more to say on that because I've got five sermons here. <laughs> the togetherness thing, though, maybe pick up on that if that's you. How am I doing? Loving the family. And by the way, loving people that I don't like quite so much, really easy to love people that we love. Well, fairly easy. Actually, it's not, not easy to love. Any, it can be inconvenient to love anybody. But even the ones that we... <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not looking down there. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Be kind. Um, loving people that are like us, that we like. Yeah, fine. Actually, that's not... This quality of loving one another, it goes beyond that. That's why life groups matter so much. We've heard a lot about life groups tonight. I love that. Good things happening in life groups, all kinds of different things. But part of life group is wrestling with people that I'm I'm not like. I didn't choose necessarily to be with. We get grown in that process, friends, and we exhibit something salty and good to a watching world. Be small was my next point. Um, or next B, next outworking of this identity. And I don't mean literally sort of be, be small and insignificant. I, I, I just find this unbelievably encouraging. Of course, there's some really big scale stuff happening here. And at one level, we interpret this passage as we have got to save the world, sort of. You know, we're God's, we're God's strategy for Cheltenham. We are. That's big. And we shouldn't shirk from that. But what I find encouraging about this is that salt is also very small. And powerful in its impact even though it's small and I think this is just a a little encouragement about the power of small the power of a word here or a word there or choosing that attitude instead of that attitude I've got a billion examples I haven't got time to give them this is not rocket science friends is it it really isn't the power of small you can think as well and as easily as I can of some of the little acts of kindness that make a massive difference and how easy it is just not to do them. But a mindset that says, no, I will just do that little thing. And it could make such a difference. I could just cook a meal for that very stressed, 
parent. It will make all the difference. I could just smile to that person behind the counter who's looking as if she's having a hard day. And it might just make a little difference. My dad did um, a few little Bible studies. He's a teacher and a couple of wayward lads in his class and or his house at school. And he, he, he did a few Bible studies with them and it seemed to make a difference. And they, you know, they appreciate it. And then he slightly lost touch with them. And it turns out later that one of them became somebody who has a whole vision to see the whole of Cornwall one back to the Lord. Um, the other one ran, was the leader of New Wine for 10 years before Mark. Small things, he didn't know how that was going to turn out. We don't know how little things are going to turn out, and I'm not saying that they all turn out like that. But small acts done with great love tend to have big outcomes, ultimately, in God's hands. Salt's like that. Mother Teresa says this, not all of us can do great things, but we can all do small things with great love. We can do that. Somebody else said this, majorities normally don't change things. Creative minorities do. And the majority just goes along in the end. Margaret Mead famously said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. There was 12, 12 ragtag people. They changed the world. They turned the world upside down. Billions and billions of lives started with those 12 that Jesus chose. Ordinary, like you and me. We should be so encouraged about this, so encouraged by the power of small. You encouraged? Let's be thinking. Small things. Tomorrow morning. What are you you going to be doing this time tomorrow? That's always a good thing to ask. Whenever you're in a church meeting, talk about this time tomorrow. Where will you be? What will you be doing? What could you be doing? How could you be blessing? Be involved. Salt gets involved in stuff. Or if it doesn't, it's useless. We're necessary, says Jesus. The world without Christ needs us. Salt's no good if it's stuck in the container, obviously. There's a great book written when I was um, a lad called um, Out of the Salt Shaker. Anybody old enough like me to remember that one? Yeah, golden oldie. Uh, Rebecca, somebody, wrote it. It was a brilliant book. Actually, I can't remember if it was a brilliant book or not, but I love the title. Out of the Salt Shaker. And the whole point was, you're salt, but don't stay in the container. What good's that? We have to get involved, friends. And not at the expense of loving one another, not at the expense of being together. That really, really matters. You've heard me speak. I use the language of holy huddles. They really matter. This is one of them. Very, very, very important. But if we stay in our holy huddles, we're a Christian ghetto. We're salt in a salt cellar that never does the business. So I want to challenge myself. It's a big danger for pastor-type characters like me. Spend all our time with followers of Jesus. Most of you, most of the time, are in uni or workplaces or, this, or, or the neighbourhood or you know, where you live and rubbing shoulders with those who don't yet know the love of Jesus. Friends, that's your front line, we might call it. That's the most, the most obvious place where you are salt already. That's who you are already. So be salt in that place with all the implications of that. Make a difference. Be the difference. You're carrying the presence of Jesus within you. Christian ghettos just present a a whole rubbish picture to the world, don't they? They really do. Tell quickly the story of my daughter, Becca. It's always dangerous telling stories about your children because you can look as if you're showing off or you're having a go at them, one or the other. Um, This is a showing off one, actually. But uh, um, she's, she's a student down at university on the South Coast and she chose to get involved. It would have been easier to live in a house with um with those who are more like her, who share her faith. She committed herself this year, second year, to sharing a house with some folks who are proving a real handful. Um, She doesn't see them as the enemy. They're not the enemy. She understands that the world without Christ is subject to decay. It's going to look broken. It's going to look fractured. It's going to look difficult. And man, has it been difficult. Really, really, really challenging. And, uh, you know, I won't tell you all. You can use your imaginations as to what's going on in that household where Becca, wanting to be salt and light in that place, is just choosing, by the grace of God, to be different in small ways. But after a few weeks, actually, quite significant impacts. Just choosing to hoover the hall stairs landing, choosing to put stuff away in the kitchen, which might have been somebody else's responsibility, but hey, I'll do it anyway. Choosing not to engage in some of the language and the gossip and choosing not to react to stuff that she could easily react to. Small things, very powerful. Salt. Last one, need to be alive. Sounds pretty obvious. It's, salt's not alive as such, but you know what I mean. Fresh, I guess we could say alive. I, I like the word alive, so I'm using it of salt. Sorry. 
Well, if salt could lose its saltiness, the implication is you can, you can have kind of dead salt and therefore you can have a live salt in my book. Um, this only works... <laughs> this only works if we are those who are brought alive on the inside. We can't, you, how many times do we have to say it to each other? We don't do this alone. We don't do this in our own strength. We don't even do it just in our groups. We do it as us and in our groups, empowered by the living spirit of the living God, the risen Lord Jesus, that we have been declaring in worship, whose freedom we love. And we will never, ever tire, ever, I think, in this place, shoot me if we do, from saying, come Holy Spirit, fill me, fill us, be filled with the Holy Spirit of God, carry on being filled like a tree um, planted, whose roots are planted by the streams of water. The whole of the, the, the ancient songbook of Israel starts like that. Psalm 1, verse 1. Get your, get your roots stuck into where there's life. What does that mean? It means the life of the Holy Spirit of God who brings us alive, who gives us grace, who enables some of these things to happen, who enables this identity to be worked out in our lives. Here's the last quote. I love this. In our day, heaven and earth are on tiptoe waiting for the emerging of a new spirit-led, spirit-intoxicated, spirit-empowered people. All of creation, Cheltenham if you like, all of Cheltenham, all of creation watches expectantly for the springing up of a disciplined, freely gathered, martyr people who know in this life the life and power of the kingdom of God and the spirit of God. It's happened before. It can happen again. And such a people will not emerge until there is among us a deeper, more profound hunger and experience of an Emmanuel of the Spirit, God with us. A knowledge that in the power of the Spirit, Jesus has come to guide his people himself. An experience of his leading that is as definite and immediate as the cloud by day and fire by night. Yes, your salt, says Jesus. The world needs us desperately. That's not a proud thing for us to say. This is not a false pride thing. Please don't fall for that. We can say with confidence, the world desperately needs us. So we need to take our identity seriously, to be different in Christ-like ways, to be different together as a loving family, to be small or at least aware of the power of small, to be fully involved, permeating everywhere, not stuck in our ghettos, and fully alive, empowered by his presence. Let's stand together. It's really simple, friends. Uh, We need more of Jesus. We need more of the Spirit. He's present to us always in mysterious kind of a way that I can't theologize, particularly present in particular ways when we gather. And if you're somebody who wants to leave this building more salty and more willing and hungry to be salt in a decaying world, then I'd love you to come and receive prayer. Simple as that.